I'm Robert Klitzman. I am a professor of psychiatry at Columbia University and the director of the Masters of Bioethics program there, or both our online only masters as well as our face-to-face -face masters and our certificate. And we're thrilled to welcome you all this evening for a wonderful panel on issues concerning physician aid in dying some of the new challenges and evolving issues involved. And we have three terrific panelists, arguably some of the nation's experts on this issue. Uh, we uh, welcome your input, your questions. Uh, please uh, feel free to type questions. Uh, Tan, you want to tell people where they should type their questions? Sure. Um, if you take a look, um, there should be a Q&A box where you can type in your questions and the panelists will be answering them um, as they receive the questions. Great. Yes. So ask questions at any point. What we're going to do is first hear from our panelists, have them have a chance to respond to each other and then address your questions. But again, please feel free to ask questions at any point. Our first panelist is going to be Dr. David Grube. He is the National Medical Director of Compassion and Choices. He is a uh, physician in Oregon. Uh, he has uh, been involved uh, as a leader in the Physician Academy of Family Medicine for many years. He was their Family Physician of the Year and also the Oregon Medical Association Doctor Scientist of the Year a few years ago. After him, we're going to have Dr. Kenneth Prager speak. Dr. Prager is a professor of medicine Director of Medical Ethics and Chair of the Medical Ethics Committee at Columbia University Medical Center. He's written widely about ethical issues for medical journals, as well as the New York Times, the Wall Street Journal, and elsewhere. Last, but by no means least, we're thrilled to have with us Dr. Bernie Lowe. He is a Professor of Medicine Emeritus and Director of the Program in Medical Ethics Emeritus at the University of California at San Francisco. He's also President of the Greenwald Foundation, arguably the major foundation that supports research and scholarship in bioethics. He's a member of the National Academy of Medicine and has uh, written widely about these and other topics uh, and has been a national leader uh, on a variety of issues in medical ethics. So without further ado, uh, Dr. Grube, uh, we're thrilled to have you join us and uh, please share with us your views. Well, <clears throat> thank you very, very much. I'm very happy to be here and I'm honored to be on the panel with Dr. Prager and Dr. Lowe. Um, I, as you mentioned, uh, I'm a family physician in uh, Oregon. I've practiced in a little town in Oregon uh, since 1977. And now I'm currently the National Medical Director for Compassion and Choices, which is a nonprofit organization that is trying to improve end of life care and allow uh, individuals to have options in all states. Um, I'll uh, share my uh, uh, PowerPoint with you now. Um, and <clears throat> what I want to begin with is to remind us uh, where we are. Um, dying in America has become very medicalized, as Atul Gawande said in his wonderful book, Being Mortal. Um, but he reminds us that even though it's medicalized and no longer uh, sort of a natural phenomenon, most all of us want to die at home, and yet very, very few people do die at home. Medicine has become so complicated, and with the wonderful technologies that we have these days in, in all arenas of medicine, the, uh, it, it, gets, it gets very difficult to die. He describes this as O-D-T-A-A, -A, and you might remember one damn thing after another. And I uh, also heard a hospice speaker say that no one can die in the U.S. Um, without an uh, ICD-10 code. These are our end-of-life options, and tonight's conversation is going to be about the, the last one, medical aid in dying, or physician aid in dying, if you will. I'll, I'd just like to define it for us. Uh, I, I imagine that everyone who's uh, listening tonight knows uh, what it is, but I think we should probably specifically say, in Oregon, we've had uh, this law uh, for 21 years, and all other st states and the District of Columbia where medical aid and dying is uh, accessible, um, have essentially the same five components. Uh, an individual, our patient, uh, has to be near the end of their life. They have to have the mental capacity uh, to be able to make this choice volitionally, voluntarily, um, and not be coerced. They are a resident of our state. They um, 
have to be an adult. And uh, finally, uh, they have to self-ingest the medication. The medication is not given to them. They must take it themselves. As many of you know, um, now about one in uh, 20 or 18 percent, excuse me, one in five or about 18 percent of Americans have this choice, although it's not a choice yet in New York. As you can see from this slide, we've been having aid and I as an option for end-of-life care for 21 years. So we have a lot of experience, and I personally have some experience about aid and dying and what it really uh, means. A recent poll, the exit poll in, in our last midterm elections, now shows that 85% of Oregonians think that this is, they support this or strongly support this. So in Oregon, well, we've had this for a long time, it's really become almost a standard of care. Many, many organizations in medicine now uh, have a neutral position on aid and dying, including recently my uh, American Academy of Family Physicians um, and the uh, American Medical Women's Association recently continued their policy. The American College of Physicians uh, is opposed to aid and dying, and I'll speak about that very briefly, as I'm not a member of that group. And currently the NHPCO and the AMA are looking at this, and just on Sunday of this week, um, the House of Delegates again rejected uh, the, the Council of, Edu of uh, Ethics and Judicial Affairs um, opinion of continued opposition um, and using language uh, such as suicide. In uh, New York, uh, the New York State Academy of Family Physicians uh, last year uh, resolved that uh, aid in dying uh, should uh, be an option for uh, residents of that state. Now, in all jurisdictions, uh, no doctor is forced to participate in aid and dying. No uh, hospice or hospital uh, group is forced. There's always a, uh, rules and regulations that allow people who, who is against their belief uh, not to participate. And if a physician acts, and according to the act, uh, there is no liability and no physician has ever been disciplined by a state medical board, and I was on the Oregon Board of Medical Examiners for seven years, um, and there's never been any discipline against a licensee for appropriate use of this option. Um, the uh, choice to do this does not affect a person's medical insurance, health insurance. The death certificate lists the cause of death as being that disease that they were to about to die of. For example, it might be lung cancer. Um, and uh, it doesn't constitute, by law, this is in all statutes, does not constitute suicide, mercy killing, euthanasia, homicide. There are Critical, a clinical criteria for medical aid and dying that are published in journals such as the Journal of Palliative Medicine. And uh, those, I can answer any of those questions during the question and answer period, but um, I won't uh, speak to the specific, uh, um, you know, in, information regarding uh, clinical practice guidelines at this time. So here's data from Oregon. Um, and this is, it can be found online. And it shows that a couple of very, very interesting things. And while indeed um, uh, there's a slight increase in individuals who use this, um, in the last 21 years, the population of Oregon um, has, has doubled. And um, still very, very few people use this. In fact, 0.3% of deaths, uh, 180 out of about 36,000 last year, um, were, uh, were, were because of the aid and dying. But almost more fascinating uh, to me and others, and continuing year after year, is the fact that individuals who go through the process, get the prescription, only two-thirds of them take it. And the take-home from that is that having the conversation about aid and dying with your patients is palliative in and of itself, just having that conversation. How do we as clinicians respond to a request for medical aid and dying? Well, we have to be prepared, and that's what we're doing tonight is having a conversation about educating ourselves. And I think then the most important thing that we want to do in end-of-life care always is listen to our patient. Why would they want this? What is the reason they would want to have this request? Flush that out, talk about that, and so often they just want to talk about it, as I mentioned. We don't need to put everything else in context. These are hospice patients, by and large. 
95% of people who choose aid in dying are in hospice. So we want, we want to uh, connect them with our hospice staff and we have policies in Oregon uh, hospices, uh, not Catholic hospices, but secular hospices uh, that uh, have policies for that. We want to explore their fears and concerns and, and values. Um, and, and I put listen down here a few times because of course I think in end of life care, maybe there's nothing more important than listening to a patient's uh, wishes and respecting those wishes if we can. Now, another myth about aid and dying is that it's because people's pain can't be controlled. And I have heard palliative care physicians talk about, well, we can control everyone's pain, but that's not why most people consider aid and dying. Most people, it's because of loss of autonomy. They, ha they are about to die, everything is out of control, and they have anhedonia, they have no uh, dignity left, they have a loss of control of bodily functions. Um, so really pains often is the fifth or sixth uh, thing on the list. Now, now I want to speak really carefully about the importance of language. Um, as B.J. Miller, uh, a fabulous palliative care physician uh, who was at, used to be at the Zen Hospice in San Francisco said, language is really, really important in end of life care. I, I think there was a wonderful article in the Journal of Pain, Journal of Pain and Management last week about um, even words like you, you had a good death can be, quite, can, can be very um, disturbing to some people. So we do have to be careful about our language. So as I mentioned before, aid in dying is aid in dying. That's a term for it. There's no reason to use language that would be cruel or harmful such as suicide. And in fact, because I have personal knowledge of this, this is not suicide. I have attended aid in dying deaths. They are with family. They are uh, generally always quiet and comfortable. They're not uh, impulsive. They're not violent. The family um, is sad their loved one has died, but they um, know that they're no, no longer going to be suffering. Whereas in a suicide, a completely different thing, it's so often impulsive. The person has a mental illness. We all wonder, including myself, the doctor of a suicided patient, what I could have done to have prevented that. And so, in fact, it's so important to use this language that correctly that the American Academy of Family Physicians just last month is now re petitioning the American Medical Association not to use this kind of language. Everyone understands what aid in dying is. There's no reason to use language that would be shameful or cause guilt. So it's working as intended in the states where it's authorized. I can give personal testimony to that. Just having the prescription on hand is palliative. People use the law not because of uh, lack of pain control, and it's not because of inadequate and good palliative care. It's because they're having intolerable suffering. And we need to be reminded that they define the suffering. We don't define the suffering. We have fabulous hospice care and end-of-life care and are improving palliative care services in Oregon. If you came to Oregon and saw that, you would see that we have some of the best hospice care in the nation, partly because we can talk about everything and share our patients what, uh, with them uh, and listen to them, uh, and, and, and that improves everything from their end-of-life care to the doctor-patient relationship. The American College of Physicians says that a reason to oppose aid in dying is because it would erode the doctor-patient relationship. Well, I can honestly tell you, having been through this with a number of patients, that nothing could be further from the truth. Having a full conversation with your dying patient about their choices, honoring their wishes, helping them through their suffering, um, can only improve the doctor-patient relationship. We'll be talking, I'm sure, the rest of this evening about the um, about medical ethics, and I am the chair of our ethics department for our hospice and on our board of ethics in our hospital. The, the, one of the premier pillars of aid in dying is patient autonomy. This is patient-centered care. This just comes from the patient. The second pillar might be, um, first of all, don't do any harm. But again, as with suffering, who defines harm? The patient should be the one that defines the harm. And so many of our wonderful modern technologies sometimes get pe give people harm.
beneficence and social justice are the two other things. One of the conflicts that we have as physicians, and I know this is personally true for me, is conf confusing our personal beliefs with our professional integrity. Um, prof being a professional means putting the patient first, putting my personal beliefs on the back and honoring their wishes if their wishes make sense, if they're legal, and if I can uh, help them feel better. There are quite a few barriers. I'm not gonna go into these right now because I don't wanna take other people's time, but I'd like to just finish by saying, aid in dying here in Oregon is not a failure of palliative care or hospice care. In fact, as I mentioned, almost all these patients are in hospice. Having a conversation about all options is palliative in and of itself. Again, there's no place for cruel or unkind language in end-of-life care, as B.J. Miller so eloquently described. And our integrity as a professional and patient autonomy are paramount. So in end-of-life care, when I went to medical school, I sort of thought the enemy was death. But I learned that really what the enemy is is terminal suffering. Terminal suffering. Suffering for, in someone who is about to die. Since we can't allow them to live longer, um, because of their suffering, the two things that matter are giving them comfort and respecting their wishes. So final slide, uh, in Oregon, since our aid in dying, which in Oregon had been called death with dignity, was passed, more people haven't died because every one of these people who choose, chose this were going to die. So the same number of people have died, but a lot of, there's been a lot less terminal suffering. I think that's uh, the uh, thing I'd, I'd like to uh, to close with. I thank you for your attention, and of course, I'll be able to uh, uh, answer any questions that you um, you might have. Great. Well, thank you, Dr. Gu, very much. That was fascinating, and we really appreciate your You're welcome. And your uh, candor and uh, openness. Uh, we're next going to have uh, Dr. Ken Prager speak. I just want to remind everyone who's joining us this evening, please uh, feel free to ask questions. There should be a a Q&A button on the bottom of your screen. Uh, please feel free to type questions and uh, hopefully we'll have a chance to uh, uh, have our panelists uh, answer them all. Uh, Dr. Uh, Prager, uh, the floor is yours and I'll go ahead and sh uh, share your slides for you. So just tell me when you want to uh, 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 yeah. move along. Okay, why don't we start then, Bob? And um, first of all, let me thank you for inviting me to be uh, a panelist with these uh, two very um, well-respected physicians. And uh, as you can see from my uh, initial slide, I'm afraid that I'm going to uh, violate what Dr. Grube so eloquently spoke about um, as cruel or unkind language. I'm saying why I am opposed to physician-assisted suicide using the term assisted suicide. Can I have the first slide, please? Um, I, I think I use this term and not aid in dying because of the plain meaning of the word suicide, the intentional taking of one's own life. Now, proponents of assisted suicide, I think, wish to sanitize the act, and they feel that the word suicide has negative connotations. But to say someone has committed suicide is neither disparaging nor a judgment. Um, and assisted suicide does not aid in dying. It intends to and causes death of the patient by their own hand with the assistance of the physician. I think it's important not to uh, plug on this because of the life and death consequences of the action involved. Uh, further illustrating the sanitizing of physician-assisted suicide is the fact that states that have legalized it, as Dr. Grube mentioned, they allow physicians to list the cause of death as the underlying illness rather than suicide. And although well-intentioned, this allows the physicians, in a sense, to be dishonest. At the outset, I want to make a critical distinction between the intentional causing of death, as in physician-assisted suicide, which is illegal in 43 states, or euthanasia, which is illegal in all states, and withdrawing or withholding life support, which is legal in all 50 states. Removal of life support, as in disconnecting a patient from a ventilator at the request of the patient or when the patient lacks capacity of the fa or of the family, this removes an impediment to a more peaceful death from the illness. The intent is to remove an unwanted treatment, not to kill the patient. Everyone agrees that patients should not be forced to endure unwanted medical treatment. 
When the unwanted treatment is removed, and if the patient dies, it is from the death is from the illness. Uh, in assisted suicide and euthanasia, however, the intent is for the patient to die. And uh, in removal of un unwanted life support, the patient is allowed to die from their illness. Uh, can I have the next slide, please? Now, there are ethical arguments, um, which I feel uh, are opposed to assisted suicide. The Hippocratic Oath which was written approximately 2,400 years ago, states, I will use treatment to help the sick according to my ability and judgment, but never with a view to injury or wrongdoing. Neither will I administer a poison to anybody when asked to do so, nor will I suggest such a course. In the ensuing 2,400 years, no normative physician credo or oath has advocated or permitted physicians to assist in the suicide of their patients, despite the inability of physicians to alleviate pain and suffering nearly as well as we can today. This is a powerful statement about a foundational ethic of medicine. Never do anything to a patient with the intent of causing death. Today, we have medications and professionals who are trained to help people who are suffering and dying. We have an expanding palliative care specialty that can skillfully alleviate the physical and emotional suffering of critically ill and dying patients and try to give meaning to them and to their families in their final months and weeks and life. The principal argument, as Dr. Group noted, in favor of PAS is respect for patient autonomy. However, patient autonomy is not absolute. For example, Physicians compromise the autonomy of people who wish to donate an organ to a loved one when the physicians consider the risk to the donor prohibitive. Physicians at times compromise patient autonomy when they refuse requested medical interventions that they think are inappropriate. Some states even allow physicians to unilaterally withhold or withdraw treatments that may prolong for short periods the patient's life, even against the wishes of patients or their families, but which are considered medically inappropriate for a variety of compelling reasons. Despite the value placed by our society on patient autonomy, the U.S. Supreme Court ruled unanimously in VACO v. Quill in 1997 that there is no constitutional right to have a physician assist a patient in suicide, and states may outlaw it. On the other hand, there is a constitutional right to be free of unwanted treatment and patients have the right to refuse such treatment, even if it is life-sustaining. There is a fundamental difference between killing and letting die. Next slide, please. It's noteworthy, as I just mentioned, that a majority of patients requesting physician-assisted suicide do so not because of untreatable physical pain, but because of fear of loss of autonomy and dignity, a desire to control the manner and timing of their death, and not wanting to be a burden on their family. These are not trivial concerns, but they are outside the scope of a physician and should be addressed in other ways. It is a fact of life that medicine cannot relieve all human suffering, especially emotional and existential suffering. Next slide, please. There are, there are practical concerns as well. When patients request assisted suicide, it behooves the physician to delve deeply into the reasons behind this request and see if they can be adequately addressed. Sometimes these concerns can be remedied so that patients will change their minds about suicide, but this requires time, patience, training and skill on the part of caregivers. There is legitimate concern that as physician assisted suicide becomes more accepted and widespread, physicians will lack the skills necessary to perform due diligence in weeding out those patients whose concerns and sufferings can be alleviated and patients who might cha have changed their minds will die for, not, for want of their concerns being adequately addressed. In 2014 in Oregon, only three of 105 persons who died under the law were referred for formal psychiatric or psychological evaluation. Can it be that in 97% of those requesting assisted suicide, there were no concerns about treatable depression or patient capacity. Dr. Diane Meyer, a world authority on palliative care and an opponent 
of PAS told me, any public policy enabling physician aid in dying must apply to the lowest common denominator of physicians, a low bar when one considers the proportion of medical professionals with no training and communication about sources of despair, much less option, options for remediant, remediating it. Policy must protect the public from these kinds of risks, especially during a medical cost crisis, and this obligation to protect the public outweighs the rights of any individual to have a physician's support in hastening death. Next slide, please. Dr. Meyer also made another important point. Public policy enabling physician aid in dying ignores the literature on physician countertransference. For example, the degree to which young physicians in particular assume that a life of disability or pain or cognitive impairments is to them a life not worth living. These assumptions, which are unconscious, easily lead doctors to agree with their patient that their life is not worth living. Not because it is not worth living, but because at age 35 and in perfect health, it seems not worth living from their temporarily protected perspective. The enormous power of a physician supporting a patient's belief that their life is not worth living has not been adequately considered. The patient may feel even my doctor agrees that I'd be better off dead. Physicians may place themselves in the situation of the patient requesting aid in dying and think, if I were in this situation, I too would ask for assistance in suicide. In addition, the fact of legalization in and of itself may be perceived by patients as coercive. Legalization gives societies imprimatur to assisted suicide. Patients who might not have considered it were it not legal might well consider it now. Are there some patients who suffer because of the ban on physician aid in dying in 43 states? Unquestionably so. But against the needs of these very few patients must be weighed the harm to society at large that would be done by legalizing physician-assisted suicide. As was stated by Dr. Meyer and colleagues in an article in Generations in 1999, she said, Maintaining laws against PAS means that some patients will not receive assistance in dying that might otherwise have seemed right and proper, but no policy can meet all ends and public policy must serve the greatest good. Next slide. What are the harms to society that might result from more generalized acceptance of physician-assisted suicide? To quote from a position paper of the American College of Physicians, opposing PAS in the Annals of Internal Medicine last October 2017, it stated, quote, legalization of physician-assisted suicide leads to attitudinal changes, subtle biases about quality of life, and judgments that some lives are not worth living, unquote. National disability groups are understandably opposed to PAS. Paraphrasing Dr. Meyer once more, we are about to face an era of unprecedented numbers of older persons with multiple chronic conditions and debility who depend on family and society. These burdens, which are a major source of distress for patients, will create a kind of unspoken social obligation to get it over with and get out of the way because of the costs of care. This is reminiscent of the eugenics way of thinking. Only those that can contribute are owed social support. The rest are just burdens. It's easy to envision, envision the permission to die evolving into an obligation to die as a public health good. Next slide, please. Slippery slope. Once people get comfortable with the act of the intentional taking of a life. In Europe, this has clearly occurred. In Belgium, the Netherlands in particular, and Switzerland, we've seen the slippery slope in action, starting with physician-assisted suicide, and then to voluntary euthanasia, where a physician causes the death of the patient for initially for severe physical suffering, then voluntary euthanasia for adults with severe mental suffering, then non-voluntary or involuntary euthanasia for adults, and then voluntary <laughs> euthanasia for children for severe physical suffering, and finally, non-voluntary euthanasia for infants with severe suffering. Once the genie of legalized assisted suicide is out of the bottle, 
it's highly likely that euthanasia will eventually be legalized in the United States. The Oregon death with dignity law can be seen also as discriminating against patients who cannot self-administer the lethal medication prescribed by their physician. Why should a patient who is completely paralyzed, for example, from their illness, be deprived of assisted suicide? Surely such a patient can be said to be suffering even more than a patient with the ability to take the pills themselves. To remedy this alleged injustice, euthanasia would have to be legalized to permit someone other than the patient to administer the lethal medications. As the tidal wave of baby boomers ages and the number of patients with dementia and other age-related debilitating illnesses explodes, there will undoubtedly be pressure for legislatures in the U.S. to allow patients who had previously requested it to be euthanized when they are in the advanced stages of disease. Once physician-assisted suicide is legal, what ethical justification can defend against the argument that patients without capacity are being discriminated against and their autonomy compromised by withholding from them aid in dying they requested in their living wills written when they had capacity. These patients can rightfully claim that their autonomy is being compromised by arbitrarily limiting their options for assisted death to a period when they have capacity and are terminally ill. They can claim that living with advanced dementia is a fate worse than death, and that once they reach a point of advanced dementia, they wish to be put to death. Last slide, in summary. Physician aid in dying or assisted suicide goes against millennia of medical and societal ethics and respect for life by sanctioning physician involvement in the deliberate taking of a life. Two, if anything, there is less need for assisted suicide today when palliative care specialists have the means to alleviate suffering at the end of life better than at any time in history. Three, the majority of patients requesting assisted suicide do so not because of untreatable physical pain, but because of fear of loss of autonomy and dignity and a desire to control the manner and timing of their death. These are not trivial concerns, but they are outside of the scope of a physician and should be addressed in other ways. Four, even supporters of physician aid in dying require thorough vetting of the patient's request. This takes much time, skill, and training. And it is questionable whether the average physician dealing with this request has the time or the skills to do so. Younger physicians, because of countertransference, may even be inappropriately supportive of a request for suicide. Five, legalization of assisted suicide may be perceived by some patients who ambivalently consider this path as coercive. A right to suicide becomes an obligation. Last slide. Six, legalization of physician-assisted suicide leads to attitudinal changes, subtle biases about quality of life, and judgments that some lives are not worth living. And lastly, the slippery slope is highly likely, given huge numbers of aging baby boomers and an ever-expanding healthcare budget. Physician-assisted suicide and euthanasia, sanctified under the umbrella of patient autonomy and relief of suffering, will be irresistible partial solutions to a crisis of increasingly limited resources for health care. Thank you. Okay, thank you, Dr. Prager. Uh, last, but by no means least, is uh, Dr. Lowe. Welcome, Dr. Lowe. Thank you. Um, it's a uh, pleasure and an honor to be on this panel with uh, my distinguished and eloquent uh, colleagues who we've just heard. Uh, I'm gonna take a slightly different tack. Um, my title's called Physician Aid in Dying Beyond Legalization. Uh, I'm gonna talk about the ethical issues that remain after a state, for example, has uh, authorized legally uh, Physician Aid in Dying or Physician Assisted Suicide as Dr. Prager uh, refers to it. Uh, I want to emphasize that the views I'm uh, going to say to tonight are my own. They do not represent the Greenwall Foundation uh, and nor uh, the University of California, San Francisco. Uh, I don't have any uh, conflicts of interest. Uh, as we have already heard, uh, in, for 18% of the U.S. population, uh, physician aid in dying is, is now legal. 
I want to say. Do you want to share your slides? Do you want to share your slides? Or no, was oh, sure? sorry. Sorry, sorry, sorry. Uh, let me go back. Uh, share. You want to see these? There we go. Great. And I go to hit slide. Uh, okay, now I've got everyone else's picture superimposed. I hope. The rest can of you, can, you can move that, but we see your slides. Thank you. Okay, good. Uh, uh, so to, let me just back. Uh, uh, no. uh, let me go back this way. Uh, even in jurisdictions where uh, physician aid and dying is not legal, a uh, patient will ask. Uh, in an earlier study, uh, 19% of U.S. physicians had been asked uh, for a prescription for a lethal dose of medicine to end uh, a patient's life, and 11% of physicians had been asked for uh, 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 active euthanasia. Is there some way I can, I've got the pictures of my colleagues on the screen and it's actually blocking my own. Yeah, if you just you could move. Oh, okay, that. I've got it. How's that? Yeah, yeah I know. Uh, Sorry. So for an, ind for an individual physician, uh, deciding how uh, you will vote on a, for instance, a, a referendum in your state uh, on physician <laughs> and dying does not resolve the dilemmas you face as a clinician when a patient asks questions about physician aid and dying or requests it. And I want to agree with Dr. Grub, your first response is to explore the reasons for the distress that motivates this request and to address that distress through the offer of uh, aggressive palliative care. I'm going to first talk about ethical dilemmas that supporters of legalization face, again, in a state where this is legal. The first question is, will you help all patients who meet the legal requirements in your jurisdiction, or only some? And polls of, of surveys of physicians have shown that the strongest support uh, for physician aid and dying is for physical suffering, intractable physical suffering. But as we've already heard, most requests now are primarily not for that, but for loss of dignity and autonomy. Second question, so the first question is, will you all restrict your own practice to only a subset of patients who request it, uh, whose reasons are more compelling to you? Second question is, if you decide the answer to the first question is yes, Will you help only your own patients or also new patients? Those of us who have been uh, in primary care and have long-term relationships with patients know that a long-term relationship, first of all, facilitates uh, plans for palliative care and also is an assessment of whether the decision to request uh, a lethal prescription uh, is informed. Third question is, if you decide to prescribe medicines for someone who has gone through the legal uh, requirements, uh, there are a number of questions. First, will hospice continue care? We heard that in Oregon, uh, almost all patients uh, who receive a, a, a physician aid in dying are in hospice. But in other states, uh, there are many hospices who do not support uh, for the state in dying and will not allow uh, their staff to uh, uh, give aid. Uh, and they sometimes will not accept a patient who is uh, requesting it. Secondly, and this gets really uh, technical, if you think about what we do as doctors when we have a question about what to prescribe for another medical condition, uh, latest on uh, congestive heart failure or oral hypoglycemics. There's a vast literature we go to, we evaluate the literature, uh, read the articles, the data. Uh, in terms of what you prescribe to help a patient who requests physician aid in dying in a state where it's legal and where you've decided to do so, uh, 
there are expert recommendations from people who've had experience doing it, but there are no published studies with data on doses uh, and outcomes. Uh, third, uh, if you are going to decide to write a prescription, uh, how do you discuss potential adverse events uh, with patients and their families? And anytime we give a, a prescription, uh, there are effects that are, uh, we're hoping the medication will have, and there's some unintended adverse consequences. Uh, and some of the ones that are documented in the literature, including, for example, uh, the published uh, data from Oregon State, summarizing their state's experience over the past year, uh, the medication will take a long, sometimes takes a longer time to, to, to affect its end of the physician's death than the patient or even the physician anticipated. And there can be physical symptoms such as vomiting or, or gasping. And third or fourth, will someone, a physician or a nurse, be present at the ingestion? And I think many patients or families will request the prescribing of the prescribing physicians. Will you be present? So these are questions you need to, to think through if you're a supporter and decide to uh, write a prescription for a patient. Uh, I think it's fair to say that it's a considerable commitment of time uh, and emotional energy uh, for physicians who do this. Uh, takes uh, effort to learn about drugs and dosages, access to drugs, cost of drugs, uh, particularly out-of-pocket costs. Uh, one of the drugs that was formerly uh, frequently prescribed, Cicobarbital, is really now prohibitively expensive and, and not available. And there's emotional energy. Now, let me say that, as I think we've already heard from Dr. Gru, uh, physicians who have done this say it can be also extremely uh, meaningful uh, as, a, as a physician to do that, but it takes a lot of time. Uh, now I'm gonna switch gears and talk about the uh, questions uh, that opponents of legalization uh, of physician aid and dying face after they've decided how to vote and their state has uh, made its uh, uh, legal determination. Uh, I think uh, we would all agree that uh, in this country where we really prize uh, freedom and uh, uh, re uh, respect for religious practice and belief. No physician should, uh, or nurse, uh, violate uh, his, her own integrity and conscience. The issue of complicity comes up for, for physicians who are staunch opponents of, of, of legalization. Uh, they don't want to be complicit in what they regard as an evil act. But I'm going to try and analyze a little bit more detail, what is complicity? I'm going to be talking about physician aid in dying and talking about the concerns the patient has that led them to their request is not complicity. So what is complicity with physician aid in dying for someone who's an opponent? Well, clearly it's expressing approval, saying to a patient, I think that's a sound plan, I agree. Second, uh, Complicity would be actually walk, going through the legal requirements with the uh, patient to see if they, uh, they actually fulfill the criteria. Third, writing the prescription for a lethal net dose of medications, uh, knowing the patient intends to use it to, to end uh, his or her life. Uh, many opponents will say referring to patient, the patient to another physician who's willing to do so is complicity. And my fifth large bullet is providing information on legal requirements also complicity. Some think so, others do not. Let me just say that in this day and age, uh, the states where it's legal by law have a state website that actually lists the legal requirements. So the, the uh, physician who's an opponent doesn't have to actually go through them with the patient. Uh, now, I'm going to argue that the following actions are not complicity with physician aid and dog. First is exploring the concerns that uh, uh, led the patient uh, to consider or request physician aid and dying. 
and certainly to, not to relieve those concerns through more uh, intensive palliative care, that's not complicity. Uh, in fact, I would argue that discussing physician aid in dying and concerns may not or does not encourage it. Uh, it's an opportunity to relieve the suffering, the distress that uh, leads the patient uh, to request it, uh, offers reasons for a patient to change uh, his or her mind. And uh, data from uh, states like Oregon uh, and Washington uh, document that many patients, uh, perhaps half, who request physician aid in dying change their minds after they get more aggressive palliative care. And of those who actually receive a uh, prescription after going through the legal procedures, 16% uh, and 26% in the latest um, uh, annual reports from Oregon and Washington do not use the prescription. And I think another important thing for opponents of legalization should keep in mind is that a clear statement of their own personal uh, unwillingness to uh, participate in uh, writing a prescription or even uh, uh, documenting that the patients fulfill the legal criteria does not preclude some long-term patients from wanting to continue that doctor-patient relationship. Uh, there are patients who prize their doctor so much, the doctor's ability to listen and be there for them, that they want to continue with a physician, even if that physician has uh, declined, refused to uh, uh, participate in their request for a lethal prescription for physician aid and doctor. I think it's important that doctors uh, think about how their personal position might impact on their patients. Uh, there are some data, and admittedly this is, uh, some of this is older data, uh, that patients with divergent views may change physicians. Uh, they may want a different physician because of a disagreement over physician aid and diet. In Oregon, uh, poll, uh, Data, data show that 2% of physicians said that they have had the patient leave their practice because of her, his physician on physician aid and dying. And in an older study, 19% uh, of oncology patients said they would change physicians if that physician provided aid and dying to other, pa to, to other patients. Now, why might this be the case? Well, first, patients who oppose physician aid in dying may fear that a physician who supports it might encourage them to consider it or even perhaps urge them to consider it. And the other way, uh, patients who are open to physician aid in dying, or at least might think they might consider it later, may not want to change from a physician who opposes it after their illness has already become advanced. So let me just finish here with a take home message. Uh, and that's that physicians who either support or oppose physician aid in dying or are uncertain uh, need to anticipate how they will respond to patient questions and requests and always be there with the patient to listen to their concerns and to try and relieve their distress. The last one is a uh, reference to an article uh, I wrote and was published earlier this year in the New England Journal of Medicine, uh, from which on which this uh, this talk was uh, was based. Thank you very much. Thank you, uh, Bernie, very much. It was great, uh, Dr. Group. I'm going to uh, give you the floor to respond to what the other speakers have said, if you'd like. Uh, thank you very much, and uh, I do appreciate that, and I really appreciate uh, the comments of Dr. Prager and Dr. Lowe. Um, very thoughtful and, uh, and very well stated. And uh, as I said at the beginning, I really am honored to be partic a participant in this panel with these, uh, these gentlemen. Um, I just would like to kind of say four uh, small things in, uh, in response to some of the things that we've heard. Um, <clears throat> the first is uh, that 
In Oregon, we've had Aiden dying, uh, which in Oregon is called death with dignity, uh, for 21 years. And there's been no change in the law. Not a single word has been changed. <clears throat> and there's been some attempts to change the law, but it hasn't changed. And so the argument that there will be a slippery slope or there might be a slippery slope has continued to fall, uh, fall down because there has been no slippery slope in Oregon. And as I mentioned, if uh, anyone came to Oregon and saw our end of life care and our hospice care, um, it's really stellar and, and, um, and some of the best in the nation. Um, the, Second thing that I'd like to kind of respond to is the idea that the intolerable suffering that our patients have, um, some of it might be out of uh, our scope of practice or out of our, um, uh, the scope of what we should be doing as a physician. Uh, I, as a family doctor who practiced in a small town, um, would try to respond to any uh, of the concerns that my patients had, and if they were... Um, such things as loss of dignity or loss of control of bowel or bladder from many of the medical treatments that I or my medical colleagues um, had given them to help them uh, prolong their life. I don't think that those were out of the scope of my practice. I think all of those things fall under the care that a good family doctor would provide someone at the end of their life. The um, next thing I would like to comment is um, about the fact that um, only three uh, people got um, a formal uh, medical health evaluation. As I explained uh, in my <clears throat> presentation, 19 out of 20 people who choose aid and dying in Oregon are in hospice. Therefore, they have, they're very connected. They have had evaluations by their primary care physician, the medical director of the hospice, the hospice nurse, the social worker, the chaplain, um, et cetera, They're, they are really connected. And if there are concerns about their uh, understanding what they're doing or uh, active mental illness or depression, et cetera, this is fleshed out. And that's why I think as we've seen Oregon, the Oregon Hospice Association go from a position of opposition to aid and dying to a position of neutrality, um, many Oregon hospices now have policies where um, patients can be uh, use aid and dying in their, uh, in the, while they're in the hospice care, and this is actually really improved. And as we all know, um, palliative care and hospice care are so valuable. I have to agree with Dr. Prager and Dr. Lowe uh, that the, we really need to improve uh, our uh, hospice and palliative care all across our country, um, and, uh, and I certainly am a, a supporter of that. And then finally, I do want to say that, um, again, I do believe that language matters. The uh, I don't think using aid in dying, medical aid in dying, physician aid in dying, sanitizes uh, this situation. The a person taking of their own life, uh, you could call that suicide, or you could call it aid in dying, but there, I disagree with Dr. Prager. I think there are uh, some overtones, um, and we have a, a, a problem in our society with uh, mental illness right now, and a lot of non-terminal patients uh, using suicide. And to complete the two, I think, um, is problematic. I have had the personal experience of uh, a patient of mine, a widow whose husband used date and dying, um, be confronted in her grief support group in her hospice that her husband uh, suicided. And it was, very, it was very hurtful to her. In medicine, we've changed a lot of words over time, still understanding what the meanings are. And I, I'll use an example of when I was in medical school, if uh, a child did not have a high IQ, we would refer to them as retarded. Well, we don't use that language anymore. We use language uh, such as uh, special needs, et cetera. We, we, I think in end of life care, we need, need to use language that clearly defines what something is, but it doesn't cause shame or guilt, fear, uh, or anxiety. Anyway, thank you again, Dr. Prager and Dr. Lowe for your excellent presentations. Well, thank you. Uh, Dr. Prager, I thought I'd give you a moment if you want to respond to anything that was said. Um, I want to echo uh, what Dr. Grove said. Could yeah, you speak a little closer to the mic if you can? Yeah, I hope you can hear me now. Can you hear me now? Yes, that's good, yeah. You can hear me now. Okay. Um, I, 
I just want to <clears throat> echo what Dr. Grove said uh, in uh, feeling honored to be on the panel with these two very distinguished gentlemen. And I think that these are very uh, sensitive and very important issues here. So um, uh, my, my disagreement is done very respectfully. And I do have a great deal of respect for what Dr. Group has done and continues to do uh, in, in Oregon. So just a, a couple of uh, facts. Number one, uh, uh, Dr. Group started off by implying somewhat, and correct me if I'm wrong, that um, in order to have an appropriate discussion with somebody about end-of-life issues that uh, assisted suicide or aid in dying, I will use the term that he finds more acceptable, that aid in dying is, is uh, necessary to uh, have an appropriate discussion. I, I don't know that that really is necessary. I think options, we, there are all sorts of options short of uh, aid in dying in terms of how aggressive a patient wants to be with medications, where a patient wants to be, having home hospice, et cetera. So there are still many uh, in-depth issues that can be discussed with patients um, at the end of life without necessarily having to invoke uh, the option of assisted suicide or aid in dying. Uh, the reason that I use the, the term suicide, and I can understand why people feel sensitive about that, is because the stakes are so great. We are talking about life and death. We are talking about an act that many people, not only physicians, feel very strongly about uh, as being unethical. And, uh, and so that's the reason why I think there are people such as myself who feel that um, it, it, it is, uh, in a sense, uh, sanitizing this, this issue by, by not using a word which uh, may have uh, negative connotations for many, for many people. And, and not all suicides are impulsive. There are many people who, uh, aside from in medicine, obviously think long and hard and are suffering greatly. So I don't think that there's necessarily a tremendous difference. Um, uh, again, I also want to point out the fact that um, it's true that most patients want to die at home, but I wouldn't conflate uh, aid in dying with dying at home. Um, my, both of my parents and my mother-in-law died at home at the end of uh, long and chronic illnesses, and uh, there was never any mention or desire and so forth for uh, an aid in dying, not to speak of the fact that it's illegal in the state that we live in. So um, one does not, this does not have to be part and parcel of, of the discussion of uh, encouraging people to, to die at home. And again, I want to point out the fact that I said at the very beginning, that I would think that given the fact that we have an expanding and increasingly sophisticated uh, palliative care uh, discipline in the United States should make it unnecessary for uh, aid in dying to um, uh, to, to be legalized. And one last point, and that is uh, coming back to the slippery slope. I certainly agree uh, that Oregon has had the law now for over 20 years, and it has not demonstrated the slippery slope. However, I am concerned that as more states legalize it and the uh, uh, situations change economically and with the increasing number of uh, elderly people who are suffering from uh, debilitating illnesses and dementia, um, I think that there is a, a real good and strong possibility that euthanasia will come, uh, will come to the fore. And again, I would challenge uh, people who are um, uh, proponents of aid and dying, limiting it to people who have capacity and who have only six months to live. What is the uh, argument against uh, expanding it if autonomy is the ultimate issue and dignity? Why then um, uh, limit it? to people who uh, have capacity at that moment. Why not give them the opportunity to write in a living will that they wish to have this at a certain time in their life? So um, I think that those arguments will come to the fore and there may even be legal arguments in cases brought to, to court, which would challenge the current restrictions and lead to a slippery slope. Thank you. Uh, Dr. Lowe, do you wanna comment on anything else that was said? Um, no, thank you. I, I, okay, all right. I mentioned that to make very thoughtful discussion. Dr. Groove, other comments? No, no, I, um, okay. I, I have no further comments in that okay. regard. I think uh, I'm ready for uh, question and answers. Sure. Great. Okay. Well, we have some great questions, and please, everyone, uh, please feel free to ask questions. Uh, this is from Arthur Kuflick asks, uh, just one moment. Uh, 
would the reasons for Aiden dying also apply to persons who are not terminally ill as well? They are not dying, but if they are suffering, and if they autonomously choose to not go on living, should they too have medical aid in dying? Dr. Grube, do you want to take a stab at that? Uh, well, thank you for the question. <clears throat> I guess it, it is uh, sort of a, a side issue. Um, what I kind of came prepared to talk about was those individuals who do have six months or less to live, uh, clearly, um, and, um, and in Oregon have this right to, for, to use aid in dying. Um, so that, that while that's very um, sort of academically interesting to me and, and, and philosophically interesting, it's kind of not my personal experience. My personal experience has been uh, taking care of people at the end of their life. And I agree with Dr. Prager very clearly that the vast majority of people never want to talk about this or have this issue uh, or consider this issue. Okay. This is a question from Dean Hart. Is this law, I guess the law is in California and Oregon, uh, can someone predetermine a stage of Alzheimer's uh, where they are no, they no longer have the capacity to choose that directive? So can one predetermine it? Dr. Gruber, you're shaking your head. No, absolutely not. Uh, the law states the, 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 those five components that I mentioned, and it's true in, in all the other six states and the District of Columbia. Mental capacity, um, understanding informed consent uh, is absolutely necessary. So there's no predetermination. Um, there is dementia that does not make a person eligible. Okay. Uh, Bob, Bob, can I say a word about Dr. Kuflick's yeah. Uh, question? Yeah, I, I think this is an important point. There was just a woman who uh, uh, had aid in dying or assisted suicide in Canada, This woman, where, where assisted suicide and euthanasia are both legal. Now, this woman had metastatic breast cancer. And she elected to uh, suicide or aid in dying sooner than she would have wanted because she feared that if she were not given uh, the right ahead of time to, have, to be euthanized uh, since she would lack capacity. In other words, if her breast cancer spread to the point where she no longer had capacity, the law would not allow her the option of euthanasia. And so she uh, uh, elected to be uh, kill herself, to have suicide, earlier than she would have because the law was not flexible enough. This is an example of what I'm afraid may well happen. And I think it's very, there is a, I think the proponents of aid in dying have a difficult time in dealing with the uh, somewhat arbitrary limitation of the six months and the capacity. And, um, uh, and she is lobbying and she had lobbied before she died for a change in the law because she felt it was discriminatory and it was uh, not allowing people to exercise their full autonomy. Dr. Grube, you want to respond to that at all? Well, um, I, I might just take issue with the word arbitrary. Uh, in Oregon and the other states, this is, was a very thoughtful process and, and looked at for a long, long time, essentially hooking it into a hospice situation. Terminal people, people who we know in spite of all the wonderful things that we could do for them, are going to um, be dying in the next few weeks or months. Uh, and people who can choose to do this or not, that was the group that um, uh, kind of flushed out and where it landed, and it's been the same way for 21 years. Okay, Alexander uh, Iyer. Oh, Bernie, go ahead. Um, yeah, if I, if I could just say something um, on the, the last question. Uh, those of us who have taken care of patients or family members of patients who have Alzheimer's and other progressive dementias, uh, it's a terribly distressful situation, particularly for uh, people who know what the downhill course will be like. I mean, I have a, a patient whose uh, wife is, uh, is now sort of later stage Alzheimer's. Even when she only had mild Alzheimer's, she remembered caring for her father and her mother, who both uh, died of Alzheimer's and she took care of them at home, and really dreaded that, hated to put her husband and her children through that. But at that time, she still thought there were things worth living for. This was before there was uh, aid and dying in California. Uh, and she talked to her husband, and he asked uh, me to talk to both of them. 
about the distress she was feeling of anticipating a decline. Uh, and that's going to happen more and more as all of us age, as, as uh, one of my colleagues said earlier. Uh, uh, the burden of Alzheimer's in this country is going to go way up. So there's, there's going to be even more distress coming up in the future on this issue. Okay, Alexander Iyer writes, uh, sorry, I just jumped here. Um, I would be interested to know each of the panelists' first take on the ethical question of whether killing is worse than letting die. Ken, do you want to comment? Is killing uh, worse than letting die? Of course it is. Of course it is. Letting die, look, we all have to die at some point. And uh, putting an obstacle in the way of somebody's peaceful death is, is wrong. I, as I said at the very outset, there is a clear cut distinction between removing an impediment to death at the request of the patient or family and killing somebody. So the answer to me is black and white, that killing is wrong and removing an obstacle to death is certainly appropriate when requested by the patient or the family. Okay, here's a question from Wendy. Uh, Bob, uh, yeah, so please. Can I, if I may, can I just comment yeah. on that? Uh, I hear that question come up a lot uh, from physicians or nurses who are asked to discontinue a ventilator or now uh, deactivate a pacemaker uh, or a ventricular assist device uh, where they feel that discontinuing uh, a life support for them feels very much like killing a patient. So even if there's no, even if logically we can distinguish that, mm -hmm. there are some healthcare workers who emotionally uh, have a really hard time with that. And I think as, uh, as Dr. Prager said, uh, trying to help people understand that uh, removing a uh, medical technology that is sustaining a life uh, in a situation the patient or the surrogate no longer wants that technology to be used is not considered killing the patient uh, and there should, uh, it should be discontinued uh, upon the patient or family's request. All right, thank you. Uh, uh, great comments, all of you. Uh, this is from Wendy De Cristina. Uh, do you think medical associations will come to consensus on how to ethically aid people in the dying process, whether assisted or not? Anyone wanna? Try that? Well, the conversation uh, will not go away. Um, I'm not a futurist, so I don't know really what all the medical associations uh, will ultimately do. Uh, I think it's absolutely imperative that we continue to talk about this because, as I tried to say at the very beginning of my presentation, and I think as Dr. Prager and Dr. Lowe both said, um, medicine is going to get more complicated, the, the population is going to age. Dying is, become, is going to become more medicalized um, and complicated. I just think of my older brother who died a, a couple of months ago. Um, he got a, had cancer, was on immunotherapy, cured the cancer, but killed him with aplastic anemia. Very complicated. Uh, so uh, I don't know the future, but there's no doubt that these conversations are going to continue. Okay. Uh, is it, did someone else want to answer that? Okay. I, I, I would just say very simply that, you know, medical associations are composed of people. People, as time changes, people change. Values change. Society, societal values change. Uh, Forty years ago, I think the notion of legalizing assisted suicide or aid in dying would have been considered a non-starter. It took a great deal just to legalize removal of life support. So, um, uh, you know, it, it's going to be in time. My, personally. I think that there will be more and more states that will legalize aid in dying or assisted suicide. I, I'm not happy about it, but uh, we live in a democracy and, um, and people will, will do what they think is appropriate, but there will be consequences. And I, I'm trying to point out what I think some of those might be. Amy Lee asks, asks, are there trends and requests for physician aid in dying that correlate with economic downturns or access to medical or hospice care? Well, my personal experience and my conversations with my peers here in Oregon, I have not seen, seen that. 
Um, I've never seen any trends in that regard. And in regards to uh, economics, uh, really, again, uh, it's the terminal diagnosis that we can't forget about. These people are about to die. I don't think that's been mentioned yet, but we think we don't know, but probably half of people who begin the process die before they can even get through the waiting periods and the meeting with the different doctors, et cetera. So um, I think we don't want to forget the context. The, the, the baseline of all of this is that the person who is wanting to talk about this, who's eligible, in other words, um, is very near death. Okay. Uh, Bob, yes. I'm sorry. Could I, could I just throw in a comment here? Uh, I just want to say that our end of life care, hospice care in Oregon is really exemplary. I mean, I think, uh, I, I think it's probably fair to say that, that Oregon leads the nation, certainly in terms of the percentage of people who die dying in hospice in Oregon is much higher than in other states. And there is a concern in California where I, I live in and still have a small practice. Access to hospice is not as widespread. And frankly, uh, Dr. Group, I think that the quality of care uh, in the hospices uh, is not necessarily as strong in some areas of the country as it is in Oregon. So I think that first hats off to Oregon for prioritizing palliative and hospice care, but saying that we should not think that every uh, person dying in America has access to high quality palliative and hospice care. No, and, and I might go further and say that we don't have as good um, and uh, uh, palliative care programs as we need to. We're behind in that regard. And in my county where I live, um, only in the last year have, has, there, has that program even been started by our hospital. So we have a long ways to go too. And I think we, that's, if there's one thing that I think all three, four panelists agree on is that we really want to improve end of life care in, in the United States, palliative care and hospice care um, need to have higher priority. Let me just third the motion on that. I couldn't agree more. I guess what I'm saying is that before we turn to aid in dying, why don't we get our house in order with um, better palliative care and end of life care before focusing on that? But I agree totally with what you say. And I, I commend you, Dr. Group. I don't know much about Oregon. I've been there only to Crater Lake once and had a lovely time. But, um, but uh, I, I'm sure what Dr. Lowe says is true. And I, I commend you and your colleagues for um, providing such excellent care to people at home. Okay. Uh, another question. Uh, what is the status of conversation strategies uh, who have to, to, to have with patients' loved ones, i.e. how to get everyone aligned and on, the, on board to make it a peaceful process for all, if it indeed is what the patient clearly desires? So, or well, I'll let Dr. Groove address that. Well, um, in my experience, uh, this isn't too much difference than trying to get everybody in align and agree with whatever the treatment plan is whether it's hospice or the ICU or whatever, there's always that. We, have, we all know the story of the son that flies in from Chicago, no offense to Chicago, who doesn't agree with any of this. I just might say though, the demographics have shown and in my experience shows that people who consider this option are extremely uh, uh, independent, very knowledgeable about what they want, very strong-willed, and their family um, has known for a long time that this is, that is gonna be part of their conversation. This isn't something really that comes up out of the blue nowhere. So my experience, and I think the experience of my colleagues is that um, this is sometimes difficult, but maybe no more difficult than getting everybody to buy into the fact that um, what their advanced directive might, might say or not say. So a question for, for Dr. Lowe and Dr. Prager, hearing how Dr. Gruber is uh, discussing a program in Oregon that's working very well. I mean, couldn't we say that should be the model and let's, if we can duplicate what's done in Oregon, then it's okay? Dr. Prager? I, yeah, I, I am concerned. Uh, we live, this is a big country. Oregon is relatively small population wise. I don't know, perhaps it has a more homogeneous population. I, I am sorry, my earpiece gets I am concerned about I am concerned about if this becomes uh, if more and more people 
have access to a, to aid in dying or assisted suicide. And um, I don't know that one can generalize from the experience of a state with a population of what, 10 million? I, I don't know. Well, no, not 10 million. <laughs> Um, not even. Not no, even. no, 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 no. Well, how, what is the population? I think it's less than four million. Okay, Maybe less than four million. Well, there's one bro block in Brooklyn that has more people than that. <laughs> you know? And and we also we also have a much more heterogeneous population. So I don't think it is fair to extrapolate and say that the excellence and the way that aid and dying has worked out in Oregon is the way it will be in the rest of the United States. Um, and, and, and that's, that's, that's my concern. And I tried to point that out in my exposition. I really do think that there are consequences for crossing the red line of doing something with the intent of taking a human life. And that's, and maybe my fears are unfounded, but I, I, that's what concerns me. So I take my hat off to Oregon, but I don't think that one can extrapolate and say, as Oregon goes, so goes the nation. Dr. Grube, what would you say? I would totally agree um, with that. Um, I don't think you could extrapolate that. It's kind of like, uh, you asked me another question and I was trying to predict the future of uh, medical societies. I, I don't think you can extrapolate the Oregon experience. Um, I just, but I do want to say um, the, the patient, it's, this is about the patient choosing. And so it's the patient choosing to take the medication or not. The doctor who's been taking care of them their, through their whole hospice experience um, is a participant in this, but it's really not about the doctor. It's about the patient choosing this. Um, so, uh, but I agree with Dr. Prager. There's no way we can know that this would work uh, in a state like New York. I was, I was at uh, Mount Sinai last week, by the way, and I met those 1 million people in the parking lot. <laughs> <laughs> I, the birdie, did you I, want to meet, I meet them yeah. every day. Uh, <laughs> if I, 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 I agree wholeheartedly with my colleagues about not extrapolating beyond uh, the experience of, of one state or two states, particularly to, uh, to other uh, contexts that may be very different. And I just want to complicate that even more. And let me just start out by saying, uh, I'm a dyed-in-the-wool empiricist. I believe that data are important and that one should pay attention to them and look at data very critically to say, what does it show? What are its limitations? And again, uh, in Washington, its neighboring state, uh, do have a program of uh, uh, state-mandated reporting uh, on all the, the uh, requests or, or the uh, deaths from physician aid in dying in those states. Uh, we don't actually collect that data uniform in other states. And I want to point out a really serious flaw in those self reports. We don't know if they're complete. And you know, it, it's really, if it's hard to generalize from the parking lot and Mount Sinai is Manhattan, right, or, or Brooklyn, uh, to, to, from Oregon. Uh, it's really hard to extrapolate from the Netherlands to the U.S., totally different countries. Netherlands has long experience. They actually cross-check uh, their self-report of physician aid and dying. It's actually more active euthanasia there. They do a population-based sampling of deaths in uh, the Netherlands, uh, and they have confidential reporting. There are under reports in the Netherlands that there are cases of assisted suicide, of uh, just fewer cases of a uh, physician, uh, they would call it a physician uh, assisted suicide, uh, that aren't reported. So I think that's a caution. We don't know how complete the reporting is because we don't know what the missing data are. And secondly, when you do that, there are inconsistencies in what physicians report and what actually happens. So they actually try and review the death certificates of this intensive sample. And there are cases in which the physician said, I, com I committed active euthanasia. And the independent investigators reviewing all the records said, no, actually that was a case of, of 
high dose palliative sedation where lower doses had failed to relieve suffering. And the other way around, where physicians said, no, this wasn't a case of physicians uh, uh, active euthanasia, it was just uh, palliative sedation. They said, well, actually, no, that's not the way someone else reading the record would, would say it. So I think that we need to try and apply the same critical thinking skills at interrogation skills that we do in any other branch of medicine. You know, it's not in favor now in this country to look at data and question it and see what inferences are valid rather than just throwing up the data, out the data completely. So I think we, 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 we have to really uh, be thoughtful about what we know and, and, not, and don't know. Great comments. Uh, Dr. Gruber, I want to come back to you, though, for a moment. In terms of how unique Oregon is, my understanding is your organization is interested in uh, spreading the Oregon model to other states. Is that right, or what would you say? Um, I, don't know, I, I, uh, I don't know if it could be – that could, is quite correct. I think that we would advocate for, other, uh, for patients in all states to have choice at the end of life. Um, so – and I, I just kind of do the clinical work, a little bit of the advocacy work, but mostly the educational component. But certainly, Compassion and Choices uh, does support organizations in states like New York uh, that are considering a law, um, because, sort of based on the Oregon law. Uh, Compassion and Choices did start in Oregon, although now they're based in Denver. Okay. A uh, question from uh, uh, Jacqueline Wen. Uh, for places where access, this gets back to a discussion earlier that we had, for places where access to palliative care is poor, should medical aid in dying be given as an option? Well, um, I don't think there should be a difference. I think there should be better palliative care. I agree with Dr. Prager and uh, Dr. Lowe, there should be better palliative care everywhere. Um, and I don't think um, if there's fabulous palliative care everywhere, I still, still think that um, it is not always going to completely control the tolerable suffering that people might have. Um, we, and I agree with Dr. Prager that we should be doing a, spending a lot of resources. The topic tonight, though, is aid and dying. And so that's kind of we're focusing on that. I think Dr. Prager said, well, we shouldn't talk so much about aid and dying. We should talk more about palliative care. I think in end-of-life arena, the vast majority of the talk that we have at the AHPM and NHPCO is all about palliative care and hospice, a little teeny part about aid and dying. So to me, uh, the two uh, are in the same place, and I know that maybe others would disagree with me, but I think, as in Oregon, we should have better hospice care, we should have better palliative care, but there will be always be a case where aid in dying uh, would be something that a person might not only want, but be eligible for. Sure, some people aren't eligible for, uh, they want it, uh, and I had patients that wanted aid in dying, and they, they, you know, they had diabetes and things. And we had, then I, as I said, then we have to ask, why are you asking this question? What's, what do you really want? And when you get and do that, um, I think we ask the palliative care questions and I think we can provide better care. So better palliative care everywhere, I agree. Ken? Uh, Bob, yeah, I'd like to answer that question somewhat directly. Let me put, uh, let me answer this. Sorry about that. Let me answer the question by saying, I think everybody on the panel would agree that in an area which is underserved with appropriate end of life care, if the only option to a patient suffering is to end their life with aid in dying, that is wrong. That is, that is no good. You can't have a situation where the only way that person can get relief of their suffering is by taking a lethal dose of medication. That is a failure of society and nobody would want that. So, you really have to buff up, I would think, your end-of-life care and your palliative care before really going into the uh, aid and dying. Once you've, once you've you know, dotted your I's and crossed your T's and so forth, then to entertain that option. But nobody should be forced into my only option to relieve my suffering is to ask the physician for, for assisted suicide because I can't get a good palliative care physician or I can't get hospice. That is wrong. And I totally agree with you, Dr. Prager. That's exactly, you're exactly correct. However, having said that, if there's a completely fabulous, the best palliative care uh, program in the nation, aid and dying may still be 
uh, needed because palliative care cannot always uh, take care of all intolerable suffering. So we have time just for one last comment. Bernie, I think you want to make a comment? <laughs> well, uh, let, let me just say that there's something we haven't talked about much today, uh, and that's in the 44 states uh, where it's uh, not legal for a physician to prescribe a lethal dose of medication. Uh, questions will come up, and everything we said about addressing those questions, and requests will come up that in states where it's not legal, patients will ask for it. Uh, and I think uh, we doctors in states, particularly, I, I would argue, in specialties where uh, it's more likely not to happen. I mean, I think uh, oncologists, uh, for example, uh, need to be prepared to both address the questions and to ask themselves, will I simply say, uh, if the law forbids me to do it, or I'm just going to roll out the possibility that there may be some circumstances that people can say a physician, after a lot of deliberation, might decide, even if the law in my state doesn't permit it, uh, I think it's the humane thing to do. So law and uh, uh, personal behavior don't always intersect. There's a clear uh, obligation for doctors to to not go beyond the law, to not do things the law prohibits. But there have been cases that have come up in states where it's not legal. Uh, so let me just stop there. Good. Unfortunately, we're out of time, but this is, I think, it's been a wonderful discussion. This is the best discussion I've, I've heard on this topic in terms of diversity of views and really well spoken, uh, well articulated viewpoints. So uh, I want to uh, clearly a lot more questions to or were raised, but, uh, but I thought this was, was fabulous. And again, I want to thank Dr. Lowe, Dr. Groove, Dr. Prager for their comments. Uh, thank you all for joining us. Uh, and uh, we uh, look forward to seeing you again for another panel. Good night, everyone. Take Thank care. you very much. Thank you. Thank you. Bye. Bye-bye.